It's such a wonderful privilege to be this morning. Today is really Sunday. Mm. Even Friday felt like Sunday, yes. but today is Sunday. And it's so wonderful that we can be found in the house of the Lord. And I think it suffice to say the appropriate that one uh, on this day to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is nothing new. It's not a story that I think most of us at least have heard the story about the resurrection. But in case you might not have heard, there is the Gospels and they talk about it, the resurrection. I'm going to go to Dr. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24 and verse 1 through to verse 8. I just want to read you those few verses. I'm not going to minister from here. I've got another text that I'm going to use. But I want to read through from verse 1 from the New King James Version. You can follow the reading on the screen behind me. Father, as we open your word, I thank you now for the Holy Spirit that will enlighten me and open the doors of my heart that I might receive the inerrant, unadulterated word of God. I pray, Father, that the seed this morning will fall in fertile soil, that the word of God will be effective in my life, that the entrance of your word will bring light. The word will, be, Father, germinate in my heart and that it will produce fruit in my life. I thank you for the Holy Spirit upon me. And I pray, Lord, as I speak your word this morning, that I would speak at the oracles of the living God, bringing honor and glory unto your name. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. And we celebrate this day the victory which we have in you, Lord. <coughs> amen. 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 Verse 1 says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. <laughs> then they went in and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? I love that. Why do you seek the living among the dead? <laughs> Let me just pause. I just want to share something. <coughs> Why do you seek the living among the dead? If you claim to be a child of God and you claim to be alive, what do you do amongst the dead? He is not here, but he's risen. Amen. Remember how we spoke to you when you were still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day he must rise again. They remembered his words, and I'm just going to stop there for now. As I said, my actual sermon, my message this morning will come from the chapter in the Bible that we call the resurrection chapter. And that is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm not going to do an expose or try to do exegesis of this entire book now or this chapter. But I want to take certain points out this morning to minister certain truths to you. And I um, want to just say it's such an awesome privilege that on this day we can um, serve the risen Christ. I want to show you a picture. Um, I've got a picture that was taken, and I'm just waiting. But the picture was taken in the year 2015. Uh, 2015, and that was in the garden, not the garden of Gethsemane, but the garden too. Can you see the picture there? Can we just have the front light saying thank you? We can leave it there for a few, just for a few. I just want to talk about something. In 2015, the first time I went to Israel, I took that picture. And that was taken from the very inside where they believed the body of Jesus was. And in preparing this message, it's like the Lord reminded me 
Now, I, I don't know exactly when it was, but the last, uh, I don't know if it was uh, definitely not last year, maybe the tour before the last, I think two tours that we took to Israel, that sign is no longer there. <laughs> I want to tell you something. The world is so unhappy mm. with the fact that Christ rose from the dead that somebody deliberately removed the sign from that door. You see, because the devil doesn't want to hear the words he is risen. Yeah. But I've got bad news for the devil. Yes. Listen, let me tell you something. When Jesus rose from the dead, somewhere between that Saturday, the Sabbath and the Sunday morning, when he rose from the dead, something explosive happened inside the tomb. And the body and the spirit of Jesus connected. Guys, don't worry about the child. Focus on what I'm sharing. Okay? My granddaughter's 100% okay. Something between that night and the morning, something happened in that very place, I believe. So much so that, look, when they, on the Friday, it was bad news. Yet we call it good news. Kind of sounds contradictory. But why would we call it Friday a good Friday if Christ was crucified? Because the bottom line is, we know the end of the story. We know that Friday was not the end. Friday was just a preparation for this day. Hallelujah! My God, God is alive! Listen, listen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not a merely philosophy, a, a philosophical uh, renaissance of the ideas and the teachings of Jesus. He rose from the dead. Yeah. It's not a philosophy. He rose from the dead. Yeah. Can I tell you what happened? When, when, when we read the stone was rolled away. Hallelujah. <laughs> Listen, when God rolled the stone away, it wasn't to let Jesus out, it was to let his disciples in. But here's the thing. God rolled that stone so far away. They tried to find Noah's Ark. They tried to find the skull of Goliath. They tried to find this and that. Can I tell you something? God made so sure that they will never find that stone. God rolled that stone to follow. I think God took the stone and he checked it off planet Earth somewhere floating. Amen. He said that you shall never find the stone because if God does a work, yes. my God, when he does a work, he does a complete job. Thank you, Lord, my God. By living a half big heart warm lifestyle. Because my God's alive, man. Amen. Come on now. The one of my serve set me free. Who the sun sets free shall be free indeed. I can testify to that. I don't need to come and stand here the cloak of religiosity. But I'm standing here with the power of the Holy Spirit in me. That can Amen. testify that Christ is alive. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh yes. That stone. That the Roman God. You, you see on Friday. The enemy was kind of. Certain he won the victory. And we know we say Sunday is coming, but come on. Can you imagine just for a moment what happened that Sunday resurrection morning? There was absolute confusion in that city. Because now the news spread. The man whom we crucified on the Friday, the body is gone. Who's going to take the rap for that? Because the Romans knew. If we fault them, death penalty is waiting for us. Therefore, they have a squadron of 16 people, four watches in the night. And every night, they had four people on duty, first watch, four on the second. In a half moon, they would sleep with their heads towards the, 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 the tomb there. And then one of them would stay up and he would look out and make sure nobody could come and fetch that body. <clears throat> they reckon the stone that was in front of the tomb weighed about two tons. There was no handle on the inside to remove it. Come on, who moved the stone? Don't you tell me the fearful disciples. Where were they? They were hiding. They thought, oh my word, there's going to be problems if that body's gone. Therefore, we're reading the story of Luke. They were hiding because out of fear for the Jews, they closed themselves inside the door. And it's actually there where the miracle happened that the next moment Jesus said, Whoppa! <laughs> I'm in your midst, God. <laughs> 
I can just see you think you think uh, uh, you've seen a king in the Old Testament. I think Darius, uh, 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 what's his name? Not Darius, was shaking when he saw the, the vision on the hand, on the wall. But can you imagine what those disciples happened to them? I started thinking they started getting the rattle and shake, and you know they started thinking what's happening here. Jesus, is it you? Come on. Don't sit here with a smiley face kind of thing. Oh, Christ, could you not see? Listen, we've got the advantage. We know the story from the beginning to the end and the end to the beginning. We can trace it back right to Adam. These guys didn't. They didn't know what was going to happen next. They thought, God, what is this? This is the last song. <laughs> but I want to talk to you this morning. I love this message about the resurrection. Because the Christian faith is the only faith or only religion in the world whose doctrine is built upon a resurrected man. Hallelujah. Come on, let us have some glory to the Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. Our faith is the only faith. Our faith is the only faith. I love Christian apologetics. I love it. I love it when God confuses the wise. I love it when God gives me a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. Because at the end of the day, you see, this is it. Our faith is not built upon a doctrine of somebody that's in the grave. Our faith is built upon the one that rose from the dead. Yes. And our yes. faith is built upon the one that is coming soon. Amen. Oh yes, listen, listen to me. Yes. I, 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 the worship team, heard that I want to just touch on it. On Friday night, you remember Sunday, Friday morning, I shared with you how my granddaughter, she's somewhere out there, she saw Jesus walking across the road on the way to the church. And she said to mom and dad, I see Jesus. And they said they didn't see anything. She said, they said to her, she's three years old. Where did you see him? He says, he's walking across the road. Friday night, my daughter phones me. She says, dad, something weird's happening. I said, Monique, what is going on? She said to me, you know what, Kinsley, she, she talks stuff. To I, I, we don't know her like that. I don't know how could she fabricate or make up these stories. But she was just saying things that was for me. Uh, it, it, didn't, it, it kind of blew my mind, but then I was immediately thinking about two things. But the one thing was that, that she said was, she said that um, uh, Monique was, she was talking on her own. Kingsley. Oh yeah, she was, took it, they took a bit down, she was singing a song to Jesus. She's forever walking with a little phone talking to Jesus. Not a real phone, a plastic one, but she talks to Jesus. And then there was a bit of a conversation, and I, I'm not exactly how it happened, but then Monique asked her, so where's Jesus? And, and when is he, is he coming? Yeah? When is Jesus coming? Monique asked her, you know what she said? You know what Kinsley said? She said, not yet. He said, she's waiting for us. Not yet. And immediately the scripture in 1 Peter 5 came to mind. For the Lord is long suffering, not wanting anybody to perish. Can I tell you what delays the coming of the Lord? The grace of God. Amen. Let me say that again. It's the goodness of God, the unmerited favor that God is saying, you get your life in order. Because when I return, Amen. when the archangel will sound the trumpet, yes. the word of God says, we will be gone. Hallelujah. But God helps you if you stay behind. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think of that scripture that Joel prophesied in the last days. You older men, put up the hand, hands. Uh, some of us are a bit, some of them are a bit older. I'm not there, but those that are much older, older. The word of God says, the older men, in the last days you shall dream dreams. Mm. Ah. But the young people, mm. come on now, what does the word say? The young people, yes. it doesn't say what age, yeah. but it says young people yes. will start seeing visions. Yeah. Oh God, I'm telling you, if we don't see, God will raise up young people to see things. Yeah. I want to say, and I said it to my name, do not despise what God is showing uh, to anybody. Yeah. Never think that I'm so spiritual, it can't be that. God can show a donkey to stop a prophet. Come on. If God could stop a donkey, that Balaam couldn't even see. I cannot discard the word of God. I said to Monique one thing. I said, take everything that she says. Write down the date. 
in a book and what it is that she said. I'd like to have a look at it. Because I'm telling you, God is giving the world prophetic signs. Yes. It's not just going to happen here. I'm telling you now, church, God will come through. If the mom and dad doesn't want to hear the Holy Spirit, God will raise up your son or daughter. Yes. Daddy, you better listen when your daughter says something. You better open your ears and do not rebel when God speaks a word in season. You see, the resurrection, for me, for us, it is the chief cornerstone yes. of our faith. You could not have the crucifixion without the resurrection. And if there weren't a resurrection, there would never have been a church. And if there wasn't a church, all our preaching is in vain. And if it wasn't a church and all our preaching was in vain, there would be no return. There would be no hope. There would be no time to have a pre-meeting. We would have wasted our time practicing to worship. We would have wasted our time to come to a pre-meeting. But because he rose from the dead. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. I'm not going to be very long. As always, I say I'm going to be pretty short. Right? But just bear with me. Because I want to share with you this morning. The title of my message is very simple. The proofs of the believer's resurrection. What are the proofs? What are the guarantees that you and I can know that one day we will be raised to life? And I'm going to talk to you very quickly about four different proofs. Are you ready? The first one will be the historical proof, the doctrinal proof, the personal proof, and the, the last one. I can just get my notes going there. The last one will be the practical proof, the historical proof, the historical proof of what? The fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 2. To verse 7. It says in verse 2, by which you were, by which you are saved. The apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Here's what Paul is saying. For I delivered to you first of all. That sounds almost like the communion. I delivered to you first of all that which I delivered unto you. Okay. So he says, I delivered first of all that which I also received. That Christ died for our sins. This is the gospel in one verse, two verses. Christ died for our sins according to what? Come on, what does the translation say? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Here's the gospel. He was buried. He rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen by Cephas, and then he was seen by the twelve. Who was Cephas? Peter. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at one time. Whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. I mean they dead. After that he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles. And then in verse 8 he said, Then last of all he was seen by me also. All right, that's not on there, but it's in the word. Paul says you were seen also by me. Now here's the point. I want to suggest to you this morning, family of God, we have, and this is not a philosophy, this is not a good thought, we have absolute 120% proof, even apart from this Bible now I'm talking, that Christ died in Jerusalem, he rose from the dead and he lived for 40 days and he ascended to the heavens. Amen. At the place called Qumran, on the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea, in 1948, a Bedouin shepherd boy by the name of Muhammad found what's today called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls was written by a Jewish group called the Essenes. And the Essenes lived between 0 to 300 years before Christ. And everything that they have seen and that they have heard, they found in clay jar pots at Qumran. The biggest discovery of the 20th century, 21st century, they found it right there. And the nice thing is, and the, the, the good thing that I can testify this morning, is that those scrolls have been kept in a safe 
keeping and it is being preserved for all these years. By the way, I, I told the story, but in case you don't know, on the day he was looking after his goats, and one of the goats walked away from the group, the like goats, they drift away and went into a cave. And this little boy started picking up stones and throwing it there on quite about a few, 14 caves, I think. Threw it into all of these caves to find out where's this goat. And then one of the caves, he just heard the shattering of clay pots. And that was the biggest discovery they made. And here's the interesting thing. Even Josephus, a Jewish historian, confirmed all of what this is in the Word of God. If you go and read the works of Josephus, and you read about what was discovered even outside of it, then you will see there's no jokes about it. No, this is not a made-up story. This is the truth. Hallelujah. I want to say to you this morning, family of God, there are demons that believe more in the resurrection than Christian people. Sure. There are demons that believe in the return of the Lord. In fact, the mad man again in Mark chapter 5, when Jesus approached him, that legion was inside of that man. What did they say? Jesus, did you come before the time to come and punish us? What are you doing here? We didn't expect you to come across the Galilee, but he was there. I want to say to you, church, we've got historical proof. As much as the devil tried to deny the Christian faith, the resurrection, the word of God, Jesus being the Son of God, I am not surprised at the bell of bowl. I am not surprised at the level that our nation has dropped to. I'm not surprised at what is busy happening behind the scenes because the same enemy that caused Christ to, to be crucified is still the same enemy that's trying to silence the word of God, that's trying to water down God's word, that's trying to tell us to keep quiet. But I've got bad news. We shall not keep quiet in the name of Jesus Christ. I will not keep quiet, church. I will walk right ahead of you. I will lead you. But we shall not keep quiet. For long enough, the enemy tried to, a so-called Christian country. Oh my word. We need to get back to the God of the Bible. Hallelujah. Amen. Mm. Listen. I know you come from the Philippines, my sister. But let me tell you something. Every year I see on television how in the Philippines, how they try to imitate and crucify people. Am I right? How they put them on the cross. Listen, you can fake anything you want to. Pharaoh tried to do with his magicians. They faked everything. We heard it the other day here from the man and minister. But when he came to giving life, he couldn't do anything. Lama, let the battle go. Listen to me. Listen. The devil cannot fake the resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. They can hang people on the cross for all I care. I don't care. They can nail them to the cross. They can die. Hallelujah. But come on. I did the entire world to bring something back to life. No, 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 you don't understand. No, Pastor, I've seen people come. No, 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 you missed the point. <laughs> Let me just help you with your theology. Were there people raised from the dead before Jesus? In the Bible? Of course. In fact, the Bible records eight, nine people that died and that were raised to life. Right? I don't have time now to explore that. <laughs> Lazarus was one. The widow from nine was one. The beta, but they learned plenty, okay? Even when they chucked somebody in Elijah's coffin on his coffin on his boat, the man jumped up, came back to life. But here's the thing <laughs> they all died again. Uh, now, I, I challenge you that one. Let's take it to that. Let's take it to the level where if Christ died on the cross and he was buried on the first day there. Who brought him out of the grave? There was no more funeral. Yeah. After this resurrection, he said, I'm alive. Hallelujah. You guys can rest in that I'm still alive. Thank you. And church, that is our hope. So my first point today, historical proof. There's nothing, nothing that is fake about what Christ did. We've got historical evidence. The second one, I'm going to jump in. Let me go to this one. 
1 Corinthians 15 and verse, let's make it the second one now, verse 14 to verse 16. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses. You see, Paul is saying, the second proof here is the personal proof. Why did Paul say that? Because you see, Paul preached the gospel to the Corinthians. They heard the word, they were transformed by the word, and now he says, you've got personal proof. Come on. If you're a child of God, you should have personal proof Amen. that Jesus died and rose for you. I've got personal proof. I remember how he changed my life. Hallelujah. Who of you have been changed by Jesus when you accepted him? Okay, who of you have remained exactly the same? <laughs> no, no, like the other day, some of you put up your hands and others keep it down. Can I ask a question? Who have you changed? If you don't put up your hand now, I'm going to ask you to stand. So who of you have changed when Jesus, who have you changed when Jesus saved you? Amen. Just hold it there. Ah, now I'll pray to you. My brother, your hands are up, so I'm going to pray for you. Okay, fair enough. I think most of us experience certain change. Am I right? Listen, you, you, you might remain the same when you go over to another religion. But when you come into Christ, you cannot be the same. Amen. You can't be. Amen. Am I right? Amen. Hallelujah. There's a personal proof. Verse 16 there, look at that. Yeah, verse 15. Yes, and we are found false witnesses before God because we have testified of how God raised up Christ and whom he did not raise up even in the fact that the dead do not rise. If in fact the dead do not rise. In other words, Paul is saying, if the dead don't rise one day from the dead, our preaching was in vain. Verse 16, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. So we have got historical proof. We've got personal proof. Number 3, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. I want to show you doctrinal proof. Verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead. This is important. And has become the first fruit. Say with me, first fruits. What is the first fruits? Some of you immediately think of giving. Bring your first fruits. That's a good thought. Not no. a bad one. Don't, don't discard the thought. But what was referred to here? Why did Paul the Apostle say first fruits? There are two doctrines that I want to just share with you here that Paul is writing to verse 23. He says, He has become the first fruit, that's the first doctrine of those who have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep here means, doesn't mean people are sleeping, it means they're dead, okay? Verse 21. So the first doctrine is the one on first fruits. The second doctrine is the one on that two Adams. Listen to this. For since by man came death, who was the man? Adam, the first one. By man, capital, that's the second one. Came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, Eve's husband, as in Adam, all of us died, yes. even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. Amen. So the first Adam, because he was a weakling, he didn't protect his wife. He was standing right next to her when she was tempted. And that Adam caused the whole world to sin. Because Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. Now you can take every song, says verse 23. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ's and his coming. So here's the point. Let's go with the first fruits. Why does the Bible say Christ was the first fruit? Paul uses a very, a very simple agricultural example. The first fruit, they, the farmers in those days, when the first fruit, the harvest was there, they had to take some of that harvest and bring it before the priest and they would wave it before the Lord to say, this is my first fruit. This is the best. 
I'm bringing it before God. Then the second thing, the first fruit was a guarantee that the harvest is going to come. So if Jesus was the first fruit, what is it happening? The harvest is going to come. Yes. And how many of you know that we live in the time of the harvest? God is busy picking people from all over the world. Not just here in Belleville. Hello. God is not just picking people in America. Hello. God is picking people everywhere around the globe. He's taking them from the Jewish people, the Gentiles, the pagan people, whoever you want to call him. Every race, color, nation, whatever you want to call him. He says the harvest is busy coming in. Hallelujah. Christ was the first fruit. He is the foundation. And the rest will follow. The rest will follow. I've got to work for somebody. Just hold on. The Lord just dropped something in my spirit. Very clear. Mm. Oh, Jesus. Can you just close your eyes for a moment, church? There's something Lord just said to me. Mm. This is what you just received. Thus says the Lord this morning. Refrain your voice from weeping. Your eyes from tears. For your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord. And they shall come back from the land of the enemy, says the Lord. There is a hope for you in your future, says the Lord. And here's the promise. Your children shall come back. To their own border. Father, I pray right now for that son and daughter that went astray. Father, there are moms and dads here in this service. Father, according to your word, we claim them back for your, your kingdom in Jesus' name. The enemy shall have no more running around with them. This morning I plead the blood of Christ over your son and over your daughter in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, that for me was a God moment right now. I want to just say something to you. Christ became the first fruit. In other words, the harvest will follow. And it doesn't stop there. Because the word of God says in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4, it says in verse 16 and 17 and onwards, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, says the Lord. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up in the twinkling of an eye. And we will meet them in the air, Hallelujah. in the clouds. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Yes. Therefore encourage one another with this message. Yeah. Soon, Soon, we will be gone. I say it this morning reverently, respectfully. Oh, God wants to do something, something, something. Yes, I just know that God wants to do something. There's doctrinal proof. If we deny the resurrection, we deny the future kingdom. My last point for this one. And this for me is the, the, the best and the, the, the it's my, this for me about the different proof. This is the, the one that I hold on to most. Is there's practical proof. There should be practical proof. Come on. Paul talks here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 31. I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ our Lord. I die, three words, I die, 
daily. Some of us say, Pastor, I don't even know what it does that mean. To put you in the very better picture, what Paul said to the church in Galatians, he said, For I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I. The life is no longer me. The life I live is a life that brings honor and glory to Him. Hallelujah. Church, you hear what I'm saying? The practical proof of the resurrection is the most important proof to me. Maybe you might differ, and that's okay. But here's the point. When Jesus saved me, if I do not live the life of a born-again child of God, then stop. Don't say one more word about Christ. Don't open your mouth. Don't talk to anybody about the gospel. But open your heart. Say, God, if your life is a mockery of what happened there, then shut up. Keep quiet. Stop preaching. Stop telling people how Jesus loved you. Because you fight. It's time to get consecrated. It's time to go and become holy. Stop playing with the grace of God. Chuck away whatever stops you. I beg you. Don't tell me you're a Christian because mommy and daddy is a Christian. Don't tell me you're a Christian because I come to the house, I stand here, I raise my hands. You fight man. You fight. Commit your life to Him. Change your way of living. Change the way you treat your wife. Show me the fruit of how you treat your husband. How you treat your mom and dad. How you treat your children. Come on. Come on. Become real family. You can hate me. You might say, I will never come into this place. I'm out here this morning to tickle your ears. That is what the world wants. I'm here to tell you the truth, church, because I love you. I really, genuinely love you. I want to see that God transforms your heart. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The word. That's two ways. When I'm here, the word already cut me. I want to say Jesus is weeping this morning. He paid the price. He hung on that cross. He did what he had to do. He fulfilled his side. He did. Where are we? We think that we can live a secret life. God knows your heart. Oh, Jesus. You see, family of God, why I get so passionate, I get, is because I ask you the question if you know Him. If you know Him. If you know him, you will know that he does not tolerate that kind of behavior. He says, come unto me, all who labor, all who are heavy laden. Stop fooling yourself. Stop fooling other people. Stop pretending. <laughs> the best proof, the quickest way this world will turn. Is when they will see born again and men and women that live the life. Yes. But the sad thing is, church, come on. My brother and sisters, the sad thing is, the Christian church has built up a reputation. So sad. So, so <coughs> sad. 
that people say, Pastor, I don't want to put my feet in the church. That is what I hear. The church is built up reputations. I never thought I would see the day that ministers fight one another. Servants of God. Never thought I would see the day that men and women of God are jealous on the success story of another man or woman. Instead of rejoicing, we go and slander and backbite and gossip and spread evil reports. Instead of forgiveness, instead of restitution, it's quick to say you forgive. But one of our 27 doctrines of the FGC full gospel church of God in South Africa is restitution. Don't just say you're forgiven. Go make right what you have done wrong. Go to that person and say, you know what, I was wrong. There was a lady that stood here, I don't know how long ago. She had the guts to come to my office and say, Pastor, I've sinned grossly before God because I slandered you. I didn't ask her to do that. I'm no one special. But she had the guts to come and say, I was wrong. Can I tell you, church, when we will see revival? When do you think? When revival starts with me and with you. And I say, it's all about my life now. I need to fix my heart. We treat each other sometimes as you play the enemy. Huh. Are you guys all awake up? I didn't mean to preach it to sleep. I still love you. I really mean what I'm saying, my dear family. I really mean what I'm saying. I, I, one day when I stand before the Lord, the chief shepherd, as a shepherd, I will report to the chief shepherd, Peter said. Can I tell you what will happen? I want to say to my Lord, Lord, I've done my best. I really have. I really preach what I believe is the truth. Yes, Lord, I surrender, God, that people got hurt and they felt bad. But I would rather let your heart bleed this morning than you bleed in eternal separation from me. Keep yourself holy. Keep yourself pure. Serve God. Stop, stop, stop in Jesus' name. When you go to the cemetery, Everybody there, like at the cross, everybody there is somewhere in heaven. But that's false. It's not the truth. That's false. Oh. The way you live is the best sermon you will ever preach. I was thinking. You know, every year, this day, what do we do? We celebrate. And doesn't this look beautiful? Amen. The cross is empty. Mm. The tomb is empty. We celebrate every year, this year, day, the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. While I was worshipping here, the Lord said to me, tell my people this. This day can be celebrated once a year. But the way you live must be done every day. Yes. You see, you can either bring glory to Jesus because there's no, it, it, it doesn't mean anything if we live on this day and we think about that. We need to live every day a resurrected life. Here's the point. I need to die. I, I just wonder, I'm going to make a general call this morning. It's just one thing I'm going to ask you in the presence of God. I'm asking you, who in this auditorium, even if it's one person, I wonder how many people will today make a decision to say, Lord, I'm choosing right now that I'm going to die daily 
to the things of this world. I commit to live for you every day. If there is someone in this house, then you can stand. I'm going to live. I'm going to die. I'm going to make that decision right now. That's what I'm going to pray to. By you standing, say, Lord, you, you don't need to stand to prove a point, but you say, Pastor, I'm standing not because I'm asking you. I really am standing because I want to live for Jesus. I'm tired of the way I've lived. You brought, you came here this morning, and for whatever reason it is, Mm. This is a holy moment. This is a holy moment. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. So that this morning you can live a resurrected life. God wants to resurrect your dreams. God wants to resurrect you this morning for His purpose. For His glory. He wants to resurrect you for a bigger plan. And a, a work that He's got cut out from you. From this day, the very last day of this year, after 12 o'clock tonight, we will not see the 31st of March again. Not this year. Forever. And I'm standing, Lord, this morning, because in this house, Father, you brought me here today, this morning, for a reason. Lord, I'm standing with the flock. Father, this morning, I give my entire life to you. Lord Jesus, I'm tired of the life that I've been living. I'm tired, Lord, of preaching your word, but my life does not even reflect your love. I walk around with bitter. I walk around with anger. I walk around, Lord, with hatred. And there's no love in my heart. But I'm standing this morning and I'm saying, Lord Jesus, I commit, say with me, Lord Jesus, today I commit, I commit that I will die daily. It's no longer I that live, but Christ in me. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for the sin in my life. I commit to you. I will live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.